Welcome to First Methodist Conroe. Whether you're joining us online or maybe here in person, we're grateful that you would trust us with your time. We don't take that for granted. At FMC, our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And our vision for that is life better together. The way that you experience life better together at FMC is by worshiping together like you are now or in other opportunities throughout the week, growing together in small group, seeking out that transformation in community, whether you're witnessing together, you're sharing the hope that you have in Jesus or serving together, being the hands and feet of Christ in the world. I pray that you'll give us the gift of hospitality today. If you're in person, there's a connect card on the bulletin that you can tear off and fill out and turn that into the offering plates as they go by. Or online, there's a virtual version that you can fill out. This will help us to follow up and get to know you. Here are just a few ways that you can get connected to Life Better Together at FMC. Hi, this is John Wagner and Stephanie Wagner, and we're excited to introduce a new ministry at FMC. First Fam is a ministry seeking to serve local children and families in their journey of foster care and adoption. First Fam will support local families through Parents Night Out events, a supply closet, support groups, and support for existing local ministries. These type of ministries helped us a lot in our journey of foster care and adoption. Come find out about the many ways you can serve and show the love of Christ to these families. Join us Sunday, April 14th, following the table and traditional services. We hope to see you there. He's alive! He's alive! He's alive! He's alive! He's alive. He's alive. Friends, Jesus is alive. He is alive indeed. I'm John Wayne McMahon, lead pastor at First Methodist Conroe. Easter is an opportunity to be together with friends and family. And for those that know God, it is one of the most important days in our faith. This is the day that we again ground ourselves in the reality of resurrection. It is a day of hope. It is a day of celebration. I want to invite you and your family to come worship with us at First Methodist Conroe. We will have three services at our Conroe campus that you can choose to worship at. Our sunrise service will be at 6.30 a.m. in our outdoor worship area, weather permitting. We will witness and watch the Easter story unfold as we sit outside and watch the sunrise. If you're looking to worship in a modern setting, our table worship service is at 9.30 a.m. in the sanctuary. You'll hear contemporary songs in a relaxed atmosphere and hear a powerful Easter message. If you prefer to worship in a more formal setting, our traditional worship service will be at 11 a.m. in the sanctuary. Our service will include liturgy, organ, piano, choir, and we will sing well-known hymns and hear another powerful Easter message. I hope you can join us for Easter Sunday and we'll be celebrating the journey to that special day beginning with Holy Week. On Sunday, March 24th, we'll celebrate with our Palm Sunday service. A few days later on March 28th at 7 p.m., we'll have our Monday Thursday service. And on Friday, we will have our Good Friday service at 7 p.m. Our nursery, our kid life leaders, and the whole church wants to welcome you so that you might find that this is a place that's excited to see you and meet you. And if you can't join us in person, join us online. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything for us. Maybe you are looking for that reminder. Come and celebrate what you know to be true or explore what you have been longing for. We can't wait to see you. Good morning, church. Welcome to First Methodist Conroe and to this table, mo Modern Worship Service. It is good to be with you. It is always good when we can gather and worship. Today is Palm Sunday. It marks the beginning of Holy Week. It is a time where we join our voices with those that cheer and support and yell for the triumphant uh, entry into Jerusalem that Jesus took, a humbling entry that Jesus took. We have the benefit of perspective to know what that triumph was like. But today we gather together to proclaim this truth that he is a king. And he's riding into Zion and he is our king. 
And so we begin with a call to worship, Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Friends, he's riding in. And hopefully, as we go into this holy week, we put him in his rightful place. Not that he needs us to do that. But with our worship, we ascribe to him what is due to him, that he is king. That he is king of kings and lord of lords. Amen? Just a few announcements I want to share with you. If you came in, hopefully you received the bulletin. Uh, On the bulletin is something called the Connect Card. You can tear this off and register your attendance. You can leave prayer concerns or register for important events that are coming up and place this in the baskets as the ushers come around later on. You heard the long announcement about Easter earlier. A lot of opportunities for you to worship with us this week. I want to challenge you to mark your calendars for Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday at 7 o'clock here in this space as well. I hope you'll join us as we worship together through this Holy Week. Friends, as we begin our worship, let's begin by greeting one another. Probably just turn around and say hi because kids are coming with palms in just a minute. So let's stand and greet one another. home here in our 
chest at every door our Savior's knocking. Oh, let him in. Oh, let him in. Oh, let him out. With every yes, his kingdom's coming. The sound of every saint reach. Oh, Jesus Christ. pour out your praise this morning on the Lord. Let's just give the Lord a hand clap offering. Jesus, we just acknowledge this morning that you are king. Jesus, you are king over everything. You're king over everything. Jesus, you're king over everything. Bringing new wine out of the sea. Once again, the crushing. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil, I now surrender. Breaking new ground, so I yield to you into your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. So make me, so make me a vessel.
and just invite you to get into a posture of prayer as we continue to linger, just to linger in the presence of God. And God, as we sang these last couple of songs, I just thank you that you are a God of newness, that you are a God who doesn't um, say it's over, it's done, that you are a God who says, I have new wine for you, that I have new life for you, that I even have new fire for you. And so, Lord, as we sit in this room together, sit at your feet, God, not in a building made of stone with wooden pews and carpet, but literally sitting in the throne room where you are, God. We just open up our hands before you as an act of receiving the newness that you want to give each and every single one of us. Lord, where we are carrying old wineskins, where we are carrying old tapes and old wounds and old ways of thinking and old ways of being. God, we ask for you to release us from that and heal us from that and bring the new. Bring the new. We receive it, God. Our hands are open as our mind is open, our hearts are open. And Lord, as the people cried out on that first Palm Sunday, God, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, they were crying out, save us, most high God, save us. And so God, that is our prayer today. Would you save us, Hosanna in the highest. And Lord, we give you doubts, and questions, we say, Hosanna in the highest, save us. We give you our cares and our concerns and our fears and our needs, and we cry out, Hosanna in the highest, save us. God, we give you those that you have marked on our hearts that are far from you, that are running from you. Lord, by faith we believe that you are inviting them into the new life. And we cry out on their behalf, Hosanna, save them, save them. And God, for the things that you have put into the hearts of the men and women of this church as your body, and to the staff, and to the leadership, God, we declare that we cannot do it. We cannot do it. But by your spirit, God, not by our might, not by our strength, but by your spirit, all things are possible. And so, God, we look to you from where our help comes. We look to you for outreach and missions. We look to you for evangelism, acts of compassion and justice here in our Jerusalem and even to the ends of the earth, God. And we cry out, Hosanna in the highest, save us. God most high, gracious and glorious, blessed is he who comes in your name. Lead us now on the road to the cross. May we follow you with faithfulness and joy, shouting Hosanna in the highest heaven through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in oneness this morning, Lord, we pray together the prayer that you, Jesus, our Savior, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. And as the ushers come forward, this is a time that we take our offering and give to the Lord to extend his kingdom in the earth. And I want to thank you for your generosity. Uh, yesterday, we had between 75 and 100 people up here. Do we have some slides, Herson? If he finds those, those will go up in just a minute. Anyway, I know, aren't they precious? Isn't that awesome? Look at the bubbles. It's a visual of Jesus rising, the way the bubbles rose. So uh, these people, probably a third of them were not from us, got to hear the gospel, got to hear what Easter really is about, and just have a ton of fun. And so thank you for your generosity. Please pray for me, with me uh, for this time. Uh, God, we come and we uh, open up our hearts. And as an act of worship, we want to continue, Lord, to just sow and believe you for great things here and great things far away. And so, Lord, would you take our giving? Would you take our widow's might? Would you take our extravagant alabaster jar? And, Lord, would you breathe on it and would you extend it and expand it and grow it in such a way that you get all the glory, God? And we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Also, you can drop your Connect cards in. is where you meet us. Take me there, take me there. What you need is just an offering. It's right here. My life is here. Now we are living a sacrifice for you. You're a fire. There were fire. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you desire, the Lord hears me, sing it again, I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you
Yes, Jesus. The Lord is a consuming fire. And we just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would bring out the gold in us. That you would remind us of our identity as sons and daughters of King Jesus. We are sons and daughters of King Jesus. Come on, let's, let's return with gratitude as we sing this doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above you. give God some praise this morning. Amen. Thank you for leading us, team. I'm going to invite you to have a seat. This may be um, just me projecting on the room, but I just get the sense that um, there's a spirit of distraction. Um. Like, I don't know if we know what to do when we sing, I want to be tried by fire. Right? Do you think about what we just sang out loud? I think some of us, if we're not distracted, we probably want to get out of the room, right? And not sing that. That's one of the scariest but also most powerful things that you can pray. Because it's painful to be tried by fire. But on the other end of it is something better than what was there before. Should I preach this sermon today? I just, I'm re- like wrestling with it. <clears throat> today David has to be tried by fire. We're going to see that in First Chronicles chapter 21, verses 18 through 26. We conclude the altered series as we look at another altar in the Old Testament. And David has to face failure here. He has to pray a scary prayer like what we just sang. First Chronicles chapter 21, starting in verse 18, hear the word of the Lord. Then the, the angel of the Lord ordered Gad to tell David to go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arona, the Jebusite. So David went up in obedience to the word that Gad had spoken in the name of the Lord. While Arona was threshing wheat, he turned and saw the angel. His four sons who were with him hid themselves. Then David approached, and when Arona looked and saw him, he left the threshing floor and bowed down before David with his face to the ground. David said to him, Let me have the sight of your threshing floor, so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped." Sell it to me at the full price. Arona said to David, Take it. Let my lord, the king, do whatever pleases him. Look, I will give the oxen for the burnt offering, the threshing sledges for the wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give all this. But King David replied to Arona, No, I insist on paying the full price. I will not take for the lord what is yours or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. So David paid Arona 600 shekels of gold for the site. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. 
He called on the Lord, and the Lord answered him with fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offering. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, I pray that you would help us to be focused this morning. Where we are empty, would you fill us? Where we are weak, would you strengthen us? Where we are wrong, would you correct us? And would you send us out once more? And God, I pray for myself that you'd speak through me or in spite of me, but may it be your message that's delivered. We love you and trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let all God's people say, amen. You know what my lowest grade in seminary was? Preaching. That's not fun to admit to you. Pretty, pretty cool, right? I mean, I, I was pretty much a straight-A student except for preaching. Um, and see, by the time, some context here is important. By the time I got to seminary, I, I knew from others and people that spoke into my life that I had some kind of gift on the spectrum of communication, that I was able to communicate and to help others. Others helped me to know that I could help people understand difficult things or relate to parts of the Bible. I, by the time I got to seminary, I had preached in all kinds of venues. I just tried to say yes as often as I could because I loved it and I want to be there. And so I was preaching in all kinds of different settings, student ministry, adults, everything in between, church camp, in churches, um, revivals. They still do those in little towns in Texas. Uh, I was getting these invitations all over the place. And so when I got to my preaching class, part of me was like, I got this. Let me just add a little bit more to my toolbox and everything is going to be fine. And even when I watched my other classmates who maybe hadn't had those opportunities, I thought, I'm good. And boy, how was I wrong? <laughs> because when I got my first sermon assignment, uh, the grade came back, I failed it. <laughs> And I was astounded. My pride was hurt. As a matter of fact, I was too embarrassed and ashamed at first. I even became a victim and was unable to learn anything. Have you ever been there before? There's something wrong with the teacher. Right? They sh- There's no way that I failed this. Look at everyone. No way, right? And, and that's where I was. And it wasn't until I was able to sit down with a trusted mentor and he helped me see opportunities to face hard truths. It doesn't mean that everything in that was something I needed to carry around, but there were things that I could learn from that was in the middle of this lesson. Failing is hard. Facing failure is really hard. And what is harder is a lot of times we don't actually have to face it. We can hide from it. We justify it. We pretend like it was somebody else's fault instead of ours. And the irony is, in facing failure, we actually grow. And being truthful for where we fell short, whether it's sin against God or sin against neighbor or sin against spouse or sin against somebody in your family, the irony is, when we face that failure, we actually come out the other side refined and different and changed. This is where David is in our story. Now our text, you have to read several chapters and we just don't have time for it today. But I want to give you some of the context of what's going on. At this point in the history of Israel, we are in the rule of King David. David is the greatest king in the history of Israel. One of the few that are even good. So the bar is low, okay? But David is, is one of the best. David's not perfect, though. He's made mistakes. We know the famous one with Bathsheba. But he messes up a lot, not just in that scenario. This one we're told here in 2 Samuel and in Chronicles, because they overlap different um, stories, is a lesser known one. See, up to this point, David has been extremely successful. Great success in conquering in the land, defeating the Philistines and the other enemies to Israel. His army is growing. Every time he conquers the Philistine army, his army grows. And it's growing and growing and growing. And so is his power and authority. It's multiplying. Well, when we get to this part of our story, in the chapter before, he decides he wants to know exactly how powerful and how great he is. And so he decides to issue a census to count, to send officials out, and to count all of the people that are in his control. Now, a census is common. Usually it happens before war, but this is not why David does it. David is doing it because he wants to see how big he is. He wants to see how great he is. 
And even as harmless as it might seem that he's doing a census, God's response is so great that he clearly did something wrong here. David's officials even tell him, don't do this. But David insists anyways. It's probably that even in giving a census, which would take all kinds of resources, would be a terrible steward of what God has given the people of Israel, so all of that given, but also it would signal to the people that we're going to war. And so now he's caused the whole country to be anxious because he wants to know how strong he is. I remember when I graduated high school, I got the biggest check I've ever seen. An aunt had given me a, a, a gift to help with college. I think it was like $10,000. And, and I remember holding this check thinking, I can't believe they got all the zeros on this thing, right? And, and, I, and I would just hold it and dream of everything that I might be able to do with this, right? That's a long ways from my little part-time gig in high school of cutting grass, right? And so I just dreamed, little did I know that thing was gone in five seconds, right? Because college, uh, 10000 doesn't go very far, But this is David holding up his check and dreaming of what he can do with it. Not acknowledging that it's not even his. God's the one who has led them to victory. As soon as David hears the results of the census, by the way, it was astounding results. Like over a million uh, soldiers that are able to take out arms, take up arms, and they didn't even count everyone. If you read through the story, there are some that chose not to count others because they disagreed with David. And so he learns that he's powerful, but it doesn't, we don't know if it's from one of um, the, the messengers of God, but he cl- clearly comes to the realization, I messed up. I failed. And failing has consequences. We know that, right? We all fail. What matters is what we do when we fail. Let me just pause here for a second. When we fail and don't acknowledge it, when we ignore a command of God, when we give way to sin, when we hurt another person, when we are jerks to our spouse, there are consequences even if you don't face it. You know that, right? I know I'm stating the obvious, but there are consequences in sin, even if we won't admit to it. And we're so good at justifying our actions. I know I'm stating the obvious, but sin against God and sin against people has a ripple effect, no matter what you do with it. That's something we're trying to help our our kids to understand right now. It's hard, right? Even if you don't apologize to your sister, harm is done, right? Right? And I give them a hard time, but I do the same thing. In an argument with someone, I want to figure out ways to justify how I made the decision that I made. This is how I got here. This is why I did that. Well, I'm sorry, when you said this, this is what I did, right? That's a terrible apology. David does the best thing in the midst of it. He decides to face his failure. It's hard to say what would have happened if he hadn't. But it would have had consequences to that too. I think a lot of what we see in the church right now with scandal after scandal after scandal that's happening is leaders who don't wake up one day and decide they want to do something wrong. But over time, they don't face what they are doing and they become jaded and they become closed off and then they make decisions that they never would have made when this journey began. David could have become a leader that would have gone to war for whatever reason he wanted to because he was powerful. But David does the best thing and he faces it. 1 Chronicles 21 verse 13, David said to Gad, Gad is a messenger of God. He says, I am in deep distress. Let me fall into the hands of the Lord for his mercy is very great, but do not let me fall into human hands. Ironically, David gets to choose his consequence. That doesn't always work out for us, right? But he's given three choices. And by the way, if you're envious of him, none of them are good, okay? They're all really bad. But he gets to decide which one he chooses. And he chooses to accept God's punishment because at least God is merciful unlike people. 
The shortest punishment would have been three months at the hands of the enemies, but he chooses to put his hands in, uh, put his life in God's hands. And by the way, side note, we know that to be true. The greatest consequence from God is usually better than your neighbor's consequence for you, right? Especially in the day we live in, culture, uh, cancel culture and everything that happens in the world, people don't want you to get past that thing that you did that was wrong. You got to carry it to the grave. Side note of the side note, let's not contribute to that. As Christians, let's believe that God can redeem anything and everything. Because he's redeemed death itself. Now David could have been overwhelmed by the shame of his actions. He could have beaten himself up saying, I knew I would fail. I knew I wasn't the leader they needed, to be, needed me to be. He could have let others point the fingers and remind him of all the ways he messed up in the past and how this was just one more mistake that showed everyone that he was a fraud. But David knew that if he could give the pain of his mistake to God, that his relationship with God could be restored. In the face of failure, David placed himself in the hands of the Lord. Friends, when we fall short, our Father in heaven is not one that is waiting for an opportunity to smite you. You know that? He, he, he's not a parent watching us fall down as we're learning to walk and then makes fun of us because we can't walk. He's the parent who is watching us fall and cheering for us when we get up to walk again. So what does David do? He makes room to face his failure. That's where the guilt offering comes in. In Levitical law, we've talked about these, these offerings throughout the altered series We haven't talked about the guilt offering yet. The guilt offering, as the Israelites were crossing the desert on their way to the promised land, God provided instructions on how they could bring the sin of their past before him and receive forgiveness. And the guilt offering was the last of the five offerings. It was provided by God so his people could make restitution for the sin they committed. This offering was meant for restoration and when a person had sinned, but it also required restitution by paying over and above the price of the sin. So, for example, think of in the Gospels when Zacchaeus has this interaction with Jesus. And we don't know exactly what goes on, but at the end of it, Zacchaeus says, I'm going to pay back four times of what I took. Because he's a crooked tax collector. That's that's a, a, a later playing out of this guilt offering. Zacchaeus is responding to what was in the law. Friends, failure isn't all bad. Because when Zacchaeus does that, his life is radically transformed. In turning to God, we can find humility and refining. Again, with my children, when something happens, hopefully as good parents, which most of the time I think we are, we're not trying to heap shame when something happens. We're trying to help them to know how they could have done it differently. How they could respond differently. I think God gave us the gift of being parents so that we can know how our Father looks and treats and guides us through this life. I think sometimes we're afraid to bring our failures to God because we're afraid of what it might cost. And I want to be honest with you today it is costly. But it's worth it. Following Jesus is costly. This is the point of the guilt offering to teach them the cost. In chapter 21, that is what's happening. David understands there is a cost that he must pay. He's trying to make an altar, and as he approaches the owner of the threshing floor, he wants to buy it. And when he approaches this owner of the threshing floor, this owner does what any of us would do if the king walked in the room, and he says, just just take it, right? You have it, I'll provide everything that you need for the altar, and I will give it to you. And thankfully, David doesn't take the easy way of repentance, right? We would love that. We would love to get the the free pass, but he knows he has to pay for it. And so he tells the owner of the threshing floor, no, this is something that I, it has to be costly for me. And forgiveness 
is costly. First Chronicles 21, 24, this is what King David replies to Arona. No, I insist on paying the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. See, friends, for David to be transformed by God's grace, he had to accept the cost. And following Jesus is costly. I believe we've confused the low barrier of entry into the faith because Christ has died for everything. Jesus has made a way for us to say yes to him, to give our lives to him. We can't earn it. We can't We can't build up enough of a resume to deserve it. It is free gift for us. But as we walk on that journey, it is so costly. That's why Jesus tells them in the the Gospels, I want you to consider the cost. Would someone who's building a tower just start building it without knowing if they had the resources to do it? Would a king set out to war without knowing if they had enough Soldiers to be able to do it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer has made this point more poignantly than I think anyone else. Especially if you know about Bonhoeffer and what he did in the faith. He says cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Bonhoeffer says, costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will go and sell all he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. David paid the cost because he knew it was worth it. I feel like some of the struggle that we have in the church, in our country at least, is we don't think it's a costly journey to follow Jesus. And some of what we've faced over the last several decades is because it hasn't cost us anything to be in here. I feel like we want God, but we want it the easy way. We want what God gives, but we won't acknowledge our own failures and sin. We want what God provides, but we won't acknowledge that the cross of Jesus Christ is there because of me. This week, we will pack the room for Easter, but only a few of us will make it here for Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. And friends, if we rush to an empty tomb, you fly by the necessary death of Christ and the necessary death of you and me. Following Jesus will cost us everything, our devotion, our time, our love, our money, our families. However, the cost pales in comparison to what God does in the surrendered life. Resurrection does not mean much to you if you think you're good and alive and can make it on your own. But resurrection means entirely something different to the person who knows they're dead. And I love this story from David because when he makes room to face his failure and he builds an altar and he does the costly thing of the sacrifice, the Lord meets him in fire. Fire is powerful. It refines. It transforms. How do you start a fire in your life? If you feel cold and alone, how do you start a fire? Do the costly thing of repentance. Do the costly thing of surrendering. Reputation, plans, free time. This isn't fill your calendar up with church activities. It is, it is a surrender of your life. 
whether that's here in this church or another church, whether it's you surrendering in this way, it's different for you than it will be for you, but how do you start a fire? You get on your knees and you repent and you make room for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he will start a fire. And it'll change you and everything around you. This is the invitation of Holy Week. Don't miss it. Don't just consume it. Your staff and your team are working hard so that we have meaningful worship services, but that's, that could be all that they are. Unless there are folks that want to gather at an altar and say, I can't do it without you. And so as Brenda comes to lead us at the table, I just want to invite you to consider a couple things today. Maybe we need to hit our knees and surrender our life to God again. Or maybe it's something small, like I need to go home and apologize to somebody. A neighbor or a spouse or a friend. Because in facing that, we are opening ourselves up so that God can do what only God can do. That's the invitation today. Let me pray for us. God, I just pray over this room right now, Lord, and I pray for fire. But we know that fire does not usually come unless there's an altar, unless there's an offering. And so, God, may it be here in all of us, collectively and individually, that you would pour out your healing, that you would pour out your grace, that you would restore hope, that you would bring freedom, that you would tell the person that feels shame right now that that's not from you. That's a lie. But shame and conviction are two different things. And so, God, don't let us off the hook. If we need to name something today, help us to name it so that your fire might come. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. It's a powerful message. And a powerful reminder as we gather at this table. Every week we have the opportunity to sober ourselves and be fully present with what is before us. Who Jesus became for us to be whole and holy. And as we approach the the table, we get to experience this unique grace where Jesus bore the consequences of our failures. Drink that in. Whatever your worst of the worst of the worst was, it's covered by this sacrifice if you will receive it. It was costly. What these elements represent are a king who laid down his life whose body was beaten and broken and whose blood was shed so that we could be holy and holy his. And so let's not approach this table today and even this time in an unworthy manner. So we're going to go into a time of confession so that we can have true communion. So with your eyes closed and your head bowed, would you invite the Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, come and search us and know us and see if there is any offensive way in us that we may confess and be cleansed.
Jesus, I think of my failures, and I confess those to you in this moment. And Lord, I also confess that I believe and receive this gift of forgiveness. Lord, I don't want to just confess this and go back and do the same thing. I choose repentance. We choose repentance. And by your grace, Spirit of God, help us to turn away from those things that are hurting our relationship with you and hurting our relationship with others. This is the good news. The Lord says to you today and to me, anew and afresh, you are forgiven. Can you say that over yourself? I am forgiven. I am forgiven. I want us to remember that Holy Week as Jesus came riding on the colt into Jerusalem. He was on his way to Passover. And as he gathered with his friends, his disciples, in that room, he took the bread and he gave thanks. He gave thanks knowing what was coming and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said to them, and he says to us today, take this, eat it. This is my body given for you. Do this and remember me. We remember you, Christ Jesus. They had the meal, and when the supper was over, he took the cup, and he gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples, and he gives it to us anew and afresh today, and he says, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant. It is given for the forgiveness of you and for many. This is for the forgiveness of sin. Do this and remember me. So Jesus, we remember you through this cup. Would you pray with me? We pray, Holy Father, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of, of bread and of juice. And as we remember the body and the blood of you, our Christ, that we may be for the world the body of you, Jesus Christ, made whole and made holy. Amen. Those of you who are serving with communion can go ahead and come forward and make your way to the station. If you are here and you're serving at the prayer altar, go ahead and come forward and prepare yourself. And I just want to remind you that we also have a gluten-free option here at the center at the front and invite you. This concluded our series on Altered, and the prayer altar is open. Come and receive the gift of the body and the blood, but make time to also come and meet with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want someone to pray with you, cup your hands like this. Otherwise, we're going to leave you alone. But if you cup your hands, someone will come to you, and we will pray with you. And if you are in need of healing, we'll also anoint you with oil and lay hands on you. Come. Darkness, open my eyes, let me.
Isn't he worthy? Friends, just a couple invitations for you this week. Um, I hope that you'll join us during Holy Week. You have those times on your on the back of your bulletin to remind you. If you're a guest and you're visiting with us, we'd love to meet you. There's two opportunities for that. If you stop by our welcome desk, we want to give you this new tube. It has information from the church and a gift from the church to you. But also importantly, in the conference room right now is our monthly coffee with the pastors. And so there's already a couple pastors over there and a few of us and some of the uh, lay leaders of the church that we want to get to know you and meet you. So even if you've been visiting for a while and you've missed this opportunity, come swing by. Uh, We'd love to shake your hand and hear a little bit of your story and get to know you. Friends, let's close our worship out together, but know that our worship of Jesus doesn't stop because we're leaving the gathered scheduled time. This disposition, this place of surrender, it goes with us. It's an invitation that you have every single day. We remember that as we say our benediction together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We love you. We'll see you next time. So here I am